Franchising is the most misunderstood and most overlooked form of entrepreneurship. We're here to educate you and help you find the entrepreneur within. Franchising is not all about the French fries. We find that individuals who are exploring business ownership tend to have a lot of misperceptions and misunderstandings about the franchise industry. So what we want to do is help prospective business owners make confident and educated decisions before moving forward or not moving forward with the business. Welcome to Unpredicted Entrepreneur. Hi, welcome to episode 18 of Unpredicted Entrepreneur. I'm Roxanne Rapsky, and this is my colleague, Sarah Wasco. As you know, we developed this podcast to pro- provide education and information to budding entrepreneurs or anyone interested in entrepreneurship. Our focus is on the world of franchising. Today, we have a guest who has a long history in corporate business, and he also, now he helps people that are looking to become entrepreneurs. Steve, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I would like you to introduce yourself, give us a little bit about your background and what you did that got you to the point of where you now consult people that are looking to start a business. Sure. After a long corporate career, I started my own business. Ran that for about five years, uh, then decided it was time to teach. Uh, Started looking for teaching positions and came across an advisor position at the SBDC. And I was like, man, that's the fit. That's the right fit for me. So I jumped at that opportunity. Um, I also do teaching as well. But I thought that was a great fit for me because, you know, I've had the entrepreneurial experience already. Had a long corporate career. uh, with a, a number of different companies uh, in, and had experiences in a lot of different subjects within business, uh, from marketing, sales, accounting, all of that. And so I thought I had something that I could, uh, some value that I could give back to people that are looking to start businesses. And what was your business that you owned for about five years? I uh, uh, started from the ground up my own trampoline company. Oh, wow. Designed it myself manufactured it myself, and shipped it all over the country. Wow. So did you sell the business or just close it? Closed it. Closed yeah. it. Closed it. So I want to say <clears throat> something real quick. You mentioned you're an advisor with the SBDC. So just for our viewers and listeners, if you're not familiar, it's the Small Business Development Center. Uh, they're a division of the Small Business Administration. They have various offices across the Dallas-Fort Worth and Oklahoma uh, area, really across the country. They're affiliated with the community colleges. So, Steve, um, is tell, tell us your last name. Shalosky. Shalosky is an advisor specializing in certain areas. We'll let you explain a little bit more about what you do, but with the Collins Small Business Development Center. Yes. So he's an advisor and their services are free. So yes. um, as I mentioned, they're affiliated with the community colleges. So they provide this advising and mentoring uh, service at no cost to existing business owners and prospective business owners. Yeah, just to add on to what you're saying, Sarah, is that um, so if you live or have a business in Dallas, County, you, there's a Dallas SBDC. Right. Uh, same thing in Fort Worth. Uh, same thing in the Denton area. So we have one in each of those. We happen to cover both Collin County and Rockwall County. Okay, great. Okay. So, what are some of the subjects or areas that you coach on or consult on at the Small Business Development Center? Every area of business. Okay. Most of the time, we get uh, lending questions. Mm-hmm. So uh, budding entrepreneurs are wanting to start a business. They need financing. Uh, We have existing entrepreneurs that uh, need financing after they get started. And so we try to help them get to that point. So we decided today in our pre-airing conversation that we were going to have Steve back to talk about lending and how to prepare yourself to get to a bank uh, and be positively viewed when you get there. What we're going to talk about today is marketing, the importance of marketing, and I don't think we can emphasize that enough on how important it is to market your business. So when someone comes in and they sit down and they're talking to you about a business and they are talking about um, market research, kind of walk us through some of the things that you, if I walked into your office and wanted to know if I had a viable 
product? What are some of the things that you would say to me or walk me through? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that, Roxanne, because they don't ever bring up marketing. Oh, interesting. Well, there you go. Okay. Almost 100% of the clients that I see don't bring up marketing. And that's the shame of it all because they don't realize how important it is. Yeah. Um, they come in, uh, if, if they have a business plan created and let's say they have their projections already laid out, I, I will see zeros on the marketing expense mm. line. They don't even give it a second thought. And so what I try to do is in a situation like that, whether or not they have the business plan is I still try to talk about marketing because at the end of the day, you can have the greatest widget ever. You could have the best service ever, just be absolutely the best in the world. But if you're not marketing it, nobody knows you exist. Nobody knows to go buy it. They don't know where to buy it. Um, so I try to educate clients on the importance of marketing. They come from all different types of uh, or they come in with all different types of businesses. Maybe it's a restaurant, could be a law firm, mm. could be uh, a medical practice. Uh, they're great at what they do. Great doctors. They know how to take care of patients, all of that, but they don't know how important the marketing aspect is. Bringing prospects in. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have it. Otherwise, you won't have any sales. Yep. Right. And so that's what I try to do is I try to, I, I, we, we try very hard at the SPDC to give them a realistic perspective on business. Most people, when they start a business, they have their own a preconceived notion of what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to start this up. They may even think it runs automatically. They just open the front door and bingo, business is off and running. If you build it, they will come, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, exactly. Not <laughs> true. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. And so what we try to do is take those rose-colored glasses off yeah. of them and say, this is the reality. If you don't market, you're not going to have prospects you're not going to be able to have any sales. So before you get to the market, does anybody ever come in and say, I've got this widget or I've got this great product um, and I think I know who my demographic is. Um, can you help me do some market research? So, so I'm sure market research is part of what you do, but I think when somebody's starting a business, and I know I was guilty of this, I help everybody. I can help everybody, right? And you, ca mm -hmm. you can't, you have to be specific and you have to, you have to be focused, right? Because Absolutely, yes. So talk a little bit about that. So again, if someone comes in with those ideas, and I get a lot of those clients, mm -hmm. actually, anyone that's making their own innovative widget, um, they don't ever talk about it. They don't talk about market research. They don't talk about the target consumer for that widget, mm -hmm. which is really just so far beyond. Okay, so... Just to give you a little bit more about my background, I spent a lot of time in corporate marketing. I worked for Abbott Laboratories. I worked for uh, the Dial Corporation, which is now a part of um, um, Hinkle, uh, a German company. I've worked for IBM, all in marketing, mm. and Dell in marketing. Oh, okay. So I've had a long corporate career of dealing with this, and I've been a brand manager on the consumer side. So when when they come in, I already know what I need to do, what I would have needed to do in a case like that. So that's what we start talking about is the first thing is, have you done any kind of market research? Who have you gotten this in front? Well, first of all, who is your target for this? That's where, really where we start to we start talking. But then we'll, we'll get into, um, OK, how, what kind of market research do you need to do? We get into the qualitative and quantitative and take them down that road. OK, you need to get, if nothing else now, a lot of these small entrepreneurs, they don't have the money to do the studies that we did at, at, at IBM or Abbott. They just don't have that kind of those kind of funds. They need everything that they have to just make the widget and have a little bit of money for marketing if they have that at all. But um, the uh, so so what I try to do is at least do some anecdotal studies. You know, go out and take that widget and put it in front of whoever you think's going to buy it. Mm -hmm. 100 people, 50 people, whatever, but get some feedback. You know, think of some questions that you would like to ask them. Um, and you can try to, you could even try to hire a freelance um, market research person to put some questions, some really good questions. So you're not kind of leading the, 
the, the, the potential consumers, uh, the testees out. But the um, but if you ask them anything and you get any kind of feedback, it's far better than nothing. Right. So that's what we talk about a lot is initially is, okay, do you know who your target is? We try to, we try to identify who that is. And then I try to tell them, go out there and start getting some kind of study together. I had a, a client that was um, looking to do his own underwear, brand of underwear, male underwear. And so we, we talked about uh, the age of his target. And he actually knew who that was. Mm-hmm. He knew who he was going after. And I said, well, then what you're going to do is you're going to make, try to make 20 of those prototypes, okay? And, and maybe even more, maybe like 100. Get them in the hands of about 20 people mm-hmm. and have them wear that underwear and then get feedback. Right. Uh, you know, the waist, the fit. Uh, the coolness, um, all of that, you know, all the things that you would want to know. And then take that data and then go back and make the modifications that you need to. Because it, it, it needs to meet the needs of that demographic. Just because you like it doesn't mean the demographic is. Right. Your yes. target is not, may not. Right. So you get that kind of feedback, make the changes, and then you start going into, okay, how am I going to launch this? What distribution channels and whatnot, so... So as you know, well, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say it's really interesting that a lot of people, you know, come to you and they haven't really thought that through yet. So what a value that you can bring to really get them thinking about those answers to the questions that they didn't even know that they should have yet um, to help them be better prepared so that they're not marketing and investing money targeting the wrong people. And you hit it right on the nose. It is about spending that money, wasting the money. Mm -hmm. You don't want to waste any money. That money is precious. People don't have a ton of it. And so they've got to invest it the right way. Why waste it on? Okay. So he goes and makes a million of these underwear He then finds out that it's not even desired by the consumer. They don't want to buy it. And he eats hundreds of thousands of dollars in merchandise. Well, and I always always talk about the fact that the number one reason a business will fail is undercapitalization. I think business owners fail to know the true amount of working capital. Everyone thinks they're going to start cash flowing or breaking even much sooner than they do. And... um, one of the biggest areas that can eat up that that those reserves or that working capital is marketing. I mean, you can be doing the wrong kind of marketing. It's marketing's expensive. Absolutely and if you're marketing is. incorrectly or to the wrong demographic, there goes all your working capital. I had a gentleman at one of my workshops at the Small Business Development Center who was sitting in the front row and it was just it was like I planted him like like the information he gave was so amazing because as you know Sarah and I work in the world of franchising and we feel that the franchisor has solved a lot of these problems right they're the they're the the founder that came to the SBDC and had someone guiding them and right, right? they got it all yeah. figured out got a successful business got multiple locations and they, they franchised it. Right. And then, so kind of the benefit is you're buying yourself some lead way, lead time, because now you're going with something that, you know, works. Right. But going back to this gentleman sitting in front of my class, who was a true entrepreneur, he was there because he wanted to potentially franchise his business. So he, he turns around to the rest of the class because he's in the front row. We're kind of on the subject of working capital. And he said that he had, his um, ramp up ended up costing $300,000 over his original business plan. And I had to say, okay, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Not 300,000 total, but 300,000 more than what you had on that original business plan. Wow. And he said he almost lost his marriage because of it. And you can see why. And, and this was 10 years later, he'd become successful. But if he said he had it to do all over again, he would have purchased a franchise because you don't know what you don't know. And that's the people coming into you don't know what they don't know. And thank God they're coming in because and they're using that resource because it's so easy just to go down the wrong the wrong path. So if you are thinking about starting a business, we kind of talked about this on our last show. Ask a lot of questions. Ask questions. Seek out mentors. Use services like the Small Business Development Center. They're there for you for those reasons. So what else do you see? Um, we kind of talked about this yesterday when I was talking to you. Um, so when you join a franchise, they have... A, a national marketing fund. 
with 2%, 3%, 1.5%, right. whatever it is. I think the the potential franchisee is always sh- shocked to find out that they also have to spend local dollars. Yeah. Right? It's not that marketing always fund's shocked. different, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so talk to us about those local m- marketing dollars in the percentages of your sales that those should be because I think those are shocking numbers and people need to understand how much money they have to spend to market their business if they want customers. Right. Uh, well, Roxana, as you know, the uh, there's a royalty fee yes. and there's the advertising fee. A lot of people don't even realize that they have that advertising fee. Yeah. So in the case of some of these uh, franchises, it's, it could be anywhere from two or three percent. Mm-hmm. And so they most uh, budding entrepreneurs or franchisees will think, OK, that's enough to cover my marketing. Um, and it's it's funny, you're right. I, I get this deer in the headlights <laughs> look when I tell them, I'm like, that is not nearly enough. Um, I had uh, this um, client that uh, was starting a franchise. The franchise was from back east. So this was the first in the North Texas area mm-hmm. of this franchise. And I'm like, okay, so you're paying in 3% for the advertising fee. Tell me what you're getting out of it. What, where are they advertising? What are they doing for you here in Texas? And it was crickets. I mean, she didn't know. And I said, well, go follow back up with the franchisor and find that out. Mm-hmm. And in most cases, it's nothing, right. especially there, mm-hmm. especially on some of those smaller local franchises. Um, so I have to tell them, I'm like, okay, well, the axiom that exists out there is 5 to 7%. Okay, so if you're only paying 2% for a national fee and you're not getting anything out of it, you still have to spend five to seven, and that's on an existing business. Mm-hmm. The reality of it is when you start doing research into this, and I teach marketing at Collin College too, is that entrepreneurs need to spend between 10 and 11% when they're first starting out. So that leaves a what a delta of 11% because the 2% isn't going anywhere. And right. if it does, it's going you know for a national umbrella, but they still have to do an awful lot of marketing, mm-hmm. 9%, 11%, whatever it is, locally to get any kind of awareness out into the community. Yep. And then we start talking through it and, okay, how do you trim some of these expenses? How do you make this the math work so that they still have profitability? So then that's the exercise that we have to go through. But yes, you're right. They are absolutely shocked. They don't realize it. And that's one of the things that I teach right off the bat is how much do are you supposed to be spending on marketing? And we're talking 11% of revenues, mm-hmm. okay? 10 to 11% of revenues. So whatever your projection is, if it's a million dollars, then you need to be thinking about spending 100,000. Now that includes all the premiums and everything else that might be included in that. That's there's, it's not just every tactic is, you know, would add up to a hundred thousand, but it's a lot more than what people think because it's just a crowded marketplace. There's just, it's, there's just social media is blanketed everything. Mm -hmm. It's so busy out there. You have to have so many different impressions to get someone's attention. And would you say, I think you said 17 or 18. 18, So let's talk a little bit about like all different Different impressions from different things, right? Right. So um, that's another shocking thing that people yeah. have trouble wrapping their mind around. Um, something I learned early on in marketing is how many impressions it's needed to induce action in a, in a target. So one of, uh, initially when I first started out and I started learning advertising, it was three because mm-hmm. we were talking about TV advertising. You had a 30 second spot, put it on TV, you're hoping that someone's (laughs) gonna call in or try to remember your product. But as time progresses, you know, in the internet age, and now we're in the cell phone technology and advanced cell phone technology, there's just too many messages. So the number of impressions have gone up over time. So experts have it somewhere up to 18. Now I've heard 14, I've heard up to 18. When you think about that number, you, so let's, let's say you put your heart and soul into a, a given tactic. Let's say it's a direct mail tactic. You're going to go mail out a bunch of uh, postcards. Um, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get 50 percent of the people are going to respond to that. When the reality of it is that you need to be thinking closer to zero. <laughs> I yes. know that sounds bad. No, uh, yeah. I, it makes sense. So I used to um, sell website and online marketing services mm-hmm. and This conversation came up quite a bit. And it's been a long time ago because I've been with FranNet for 10 years. So it was prior to that. 
But what we discussed with people is the fact that when that direct mail piece arrives, they may not need that service. Exactly. But then they've gone online six months, a year later, two years later. They might have heard it on the radio because it, it, with just one direct mail piece, they may not remember it. Then they have a need. Maybe it's something for their home or their automobile or whatever. Then likely they're going to go online. And then if your business shows up and they say, oh, yeah, I remember getting that card or I remember hearing them on the radio or that sort of thing. So it makes perfect sense, those number of impressions for people to remember what they saw or heard or read over a period of time, because when you're targeting them, they may not have a need. And I think it's one percent maybe at most of expectation or one to three percent when you do direct mail that somebody would actually respond and be you a hit prospect. the nail on the head again okay. yes absolutely one percent okay. so i try to level set their expectations mm -hmm. um, and direct mail is one of the more expensive paths mm -hmm. to take yes. and then when you think okay i i'm only going to expect one percent but it is definitely a marathon and not a sprint when it comes yeah. to marketing well no one besides perhaps some seasonal companies, you know, like uh, Christmas light, lighting companies and, and companies like that, where they are land, maybe landscaping as well. I mean, it might be included in that, but very few companies know when a customer is going to purchase something. <laughs> and so that's why those impressions are so, why they have to be so many, mm -hmm. because you have to constantly, they're, they're not interested in buying right now. Right. For whatever reason, they're with another vendor, they're happy with that vendor, or they're just not in need of that item yet. And so you have to be constantly knocking at the door, hey, do you need this? 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 Over and over again until, hey, I need it now. Oh, okay, they were just here yesterday. Yes. Light comes on, you contact that company. And they've been, do they've been diligent in trying to earn my business, so I will give them an opportunity. Exactly. So, and depending on your business, there's a lot of boots on the ground, kind of out of the box things that you can do too. Like I remember, um, one of the grand openings we went to, I think it was smoothies. Um, one of their tactics was, um, to go to like all the, the offices, like the, mm -hmm. where people are working. Right. And take little samples, just give them away and let them taste how wonderful it is. And mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many people that will bring in the door. Absolutely. Uh, you know, just getting out in the community. We talk about when you when you are opening a business, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable because a lot of this stuff is uncomfortable for you if you've always worked for someone else and you haven't had to put yourself out there. So finding creative ways to get out in the community. We joke about shaking hands and kissing babies. Uh, but, you know, being Almost the like a politician. Yeah. I, and I always try to make sure I don't do that backwards. You don't want to shake the babies. Um, <laughs> so, no, definitely like a politician. you got to be out there mm -hmm. and being the face of your business. And once again, it depends on what you do. But I always say that people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. Well, how are they ever going to like you or trust you if they don't know you? Yes. You know, it's That's different right. if you're just hungry and you're going to run in somewhere and get a, a burger or a salad. But there's a lot of businesses where there needs to be some likability and some trust and um especially if it's things that are you know smoothies a little bit of a different because people might drink those pretty regularly and they're a low cost but yeah. if you're gonna do a new vehicle you're gonna do home repairs you're gonna do remodeling trust is huge yeah. and they really have to um you know you i can see where you really have to take some time to build that trust uh with your prospective candidates and it's frustrating because a lot of that's hard to measure you have no way of knowing how many times they might have thrown away your flyer before actually taking a look at it when they had a need and it's hard very hard to measure a lot of different things and that's yes. another thing that i teach um and i tell my clients that as well is that you have to get out of this mode of comparing it to, I guess maybe they're comparing it to sales. It's not the same. It's not. Sales and marketing are grouped together and they are very different. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And so once they get away from that need to have a certain percentage, like I've got to have this, I've got to have that, they and they realize that in awareness building, you're not going to get a response. 
then they start to get it finally. But they have to believe in it first. They have to believe that marketing is going to work eventually, that, that those pr impressions that are going out there are going to work. And, and Roxanne, you mentioned about going out in the community. And we, I was just talking with my client about that yesterday. It was a franchisee. Mm -hmm. he, he came in for, uh, we, we were talking about uh, actually financing mm -hmm. and getting his business plan ready to go. And we were hel I was helping him with that. But we got on the subject of marketing because that's always near and dear to my heart. And so <laughs> we start talking about it. And that's exactly what their plan was. I was actually shocked of how, now he was on the sales side. Mm -hmm. his, um, his partner was a doctor, so she didn't ex exactly know. But he seemed to, to realize that he needed to get out in the community, get some of his product in the hands of people, uh, start building that trust up. Mm -hmm. And I was just, uh, it's its really nice to see when I, I do have a client that comes in and kind of already understands that. And I'm like, oh, okay, great, well, it's not such a sell. People with a sales background, or for me, are a lot of fun to work with because because they get it right. Yeah. They understand what it takes mm -hmm. to go, and it's all about numbers. Putting you know the funnel right, throwing stuff in the top of the funnel. Um, your more technical folks that have like you know the the back room folks, like the engineers and the, the you know the IT IT those folks. It's harder for them, right? Because that's that's not their world. But the one thing is, is that if you're in management within a company. You don't realize it, but you are in some level of sales because you're working with teams and you're selling ideas. You're trying to get people to sign off on things. So you kind of have to help those folks understand that they do have some experience with that. Um, Just maybe a different perception of what it entails. Yeah. And it's definitely uncomfortable for them. Like, like if I get a client that's a ph pharmaceutical sales rep, a dog, like they get it. I mean, they do. I mean, they're going into doctor's offices and they, they know, right? They understand. So, um, well, another thing that I teach in my marketing class is personality types. Yes. Oh, yes. So we oh, talk yes. about introverts yes. versus extroverts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're, let's say that you happen to be just on the little, on the one side of introversion, you're, you are going to avoid your sales and marketing like it's a bad habit. Yeah. Like you are going to try to just get a, completely away from it. You're going to spend more time on the finances. You're going to overdevelop your products or services. You're going to do everything you can to yep. stay away from it. Yes. Then it sneaks up on them. They have to do it at some point. Or they have to hire for it. Or they have Absolutely. to hire for it. And that's yeah. another thing that we advise is yeah. hire the talent that you aren't comfortable doing those tasks. Yes. Hire that talent. It's out there. Now they get shocked when we talk about marketing and sales staff and what they will, what they should be paid. So yeah. that's like, okay, go out and get some learning, you know, learn about it, you know, see if you can pick up some of it. So much smarter to hire somebody that's good at that when that's not your strength that's, and you could be focusing your strength on something that you are good at. True. Well, and build that into your business plan, whatever mm -hmm. those numbers are, so that when you go to the bank for the loan, that working capital that you need is built into that project, and then you have more money available to do what you should be doing. Right. Work with your own strengths and let, you know, hire other people to do theirs. Another thing about marketing I was just thinking about while um, we were visiting here is that I think sometimes, too, when things are a little slow in business and maybe the money's not coming in as we hope, yeah. then we cut back on marketing. Mm -hmm. And... That's, Which is the worst thing to do. It's the worst thing to do. Marketing is the area that you need to not cut back on and actually expand. And a lot of times when we're busy, we don't have time for marketing or whatever because we're rocking and rolling. Well, all businesses ebb and flow. And then you're like, oh, goodness, well, I haven't been marketing the last six months because I've been so busy. And now I've finished all my projects. And now what do I do? So it is not something that you can just kind of start. I mean, I, you should tell me because this is your area of expertise, but I don't see it as something that should start and stop. And I think sometimes we have issues of being consistent with, with marketing strategies. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. So you have to constantly market. Mm -hmm. You never know when those consumers are going to get it. When, when is that magic 18 going to be where it has induces induced action on the part of the target and then they're going to contact you so you have to constantly you have to constantly market all the time uh, your whole year should be filled with activities um, now I understand uh, my passion okay and I understand also what a chief everything officer has to go through 
Okay, they have everything. Res- mm-hmm. They're responsible for everything. But you still you if you don't have that marketing in place, you will not have the prospects coming in, so you can't convert them to customers. It's that's why it's so important. And you don't know when that is, and right. so when they're going to buy and or when they're going to get it. So you have to constantly be doing it. Now I talk about segmentation too, and in, in my classes, and I don't know if this is the right venue for that today to talk about it. But if you can segment them from at least uh, ones you haven't contacted before, ones that you have contacted, and customers, that would be nice at least, at the very least, so that you have different messages because the messages matter too. You know, just because you do a tactic, if you're saying all the wrong things, yeah, true, that isn't good either. No, that's yeah. a negative equity that counts against you. Yeah. So you've you've got to speak the language that it that um, is uh, impactful for them. Like they get it. It drives that emotion. I want to contact this company. Um, and there's a lot to learn, I think, for entrepreneurs in the marketing area. But I. I Entrepreneurs really need to spend more time thinking about it and doing it, for sure. So if we have any entrepreneurs listening today and they want to get a hold of you, Steve, how do they find you? The best way is to just do a Google search for Colin SBDC. Okay. And on our webpage, there's a client needs assessment. Um, it's uh, on the masthead, on the menu. You, you'll see um, a client needs assessment. You okay. just, they just click on it. They'll fill in some basic information, name, phone number, email, just some basic information. And then uh, our process will uh, we'll have someone contact them and uh, get them pointed in the right direction. I love how the Small Business Development Center has experts in so many different areas. Yeah. So when they fill out that assessment, then um, it will match the business owner or prospective business owner with the with the advisor that has the expertise that they need. And then certainly, as you mentioned, they may get there and figure out that they need a lot more. And so everybody is very well versed in lots of different areas. That's true. Every one of our advisors have uh, been a small business owner at one time. And so coming from that experience yeah. is very helpful, but we've all done different things. I've had more of a corporate career than others. Um, we have a real estate expert in there. We have an investment banker that's been in there and an owner of, a, um, of the uh, preschools. And so we, we bring that diverse background in entrepreneurial ventures into our advising. That's yes. awesome. Well, we're going to have to have you back and some of okay. your colleagues, um, but we'll bring for you sure. back for another subject. Okay. And um, we appreciate you coming to visit with us and educate us and our listeners. So thank you, Steve. It was my pleasure, Roxanne. It was really great to have you. We um, appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us. Um, Please uh, find us, find Unpredicted Entrepreneur on uh, our YouTube channel, which is FriendNet of Dallas, Fort Worth, and Oklahoma. Um, Please connect with us on LinkedIn. My name again is Sarah Wasco. It's W-A-S-K-O-W. This is my colleague Roxanne Rapsky, R-A-P-S-K-E. We look forward to connecting with you, providing more value um, as you pursue or consider pursuing business ownership. Um, Thanks again for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Bye.